Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for being here today on another glorious day. And fortunately, uh, we uh, will all be outside soon. Uh, we need a hard stop. I'm looking at my friend from the Associated Press at 2 o'clock so that people can get out to the Rose Garden for the announcement the President is making from there at 2.15. Uh, because of that, I will refrain from opening statements and go straight to questions. Yes, sir. Thanks, Jay. Are you concerned at all that by selecting Susan Rice, uh, there will be more fuel in the debate over Benghazi, just as, as the White House is trying to look at other things other than that issue? Uh, not at all. Uh, let me say a couple of things. Ambassador Rice is one of the most qualified and experienced uh, experts in the field of foreign policy in the country. She has uh, served with distinction as the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. She has served in various capacities in the National Security Council and at the, and at the State Department. She is extremely smart, she is extremely experienced, and she is extremely tough. And she has been a principal on the President's foreign policy team uh, throughout his presidency and as a foreign policy advisor prior to that. When it comes to Benghazi, I would say a couple of things. First, what we learned uh, through the revival of this story and the release of emails and uh, talking points uh, was uh, what we had said all along, which is that Ambassador Rice went out to the Sunday shows and uh, conveyed what was the intelligence community's best assessment of what had happened in Benghazi at the time. It is fully apparent from any fair review of the talking points and their evolution that that was the case. Uh, the one factual issue that was ever a matter of dispute and concern uh, was clearly drafted by the intelligence community, and I would point you to statements by uh, the DNI director and the uh, director of the CIA and director of the, uh, deputy director of the CIA uh, to back that up. So finally, I would say that we've seen uh, an enormous amount of positive reaction to uh, the President's decision to make Ambassador Rice a national security advisor, his national security advisor, and, uh, and that includes, uh, we've also seen statements from Senators McCain and Graham and Ayotte, who obviously have played a role uh, in the uh, discussions about the Benghazi talking points, saying that they uh, will be working with her as national security advisor. So we think um, uh, we're very pleased by that and by the reception uh, to this announcement that we're seeing today. And both Ambassador Rice and Samantha Power have had a major role when it comes to Syria. Do their selections <coughs> signal a uh, desire to move the ball forward at all on that issue? Well, I would say a couple of things. Both uh, Samantha Power and Ambassador Rice have been advisors to the President on national security matters uh, throughout uh, his time as President, uh, or almost throughout it, since uh, Samantha left uh, the National Security Council and. Uh, at the end of the first term. But the, the fact of the matter is the President wants and expects the principals on his national security team uh, to have st strongly held views that they express in uh, meetings with him. Uh, that's why he has uh, a strong Secretary of Defense, a strong CIA director, a strong Secretary of State, uh, which was obviously the case uh, in his first term as well. But ultimately, it is the President of the United States who assesses the views of his foreign policy team when there are issues to be debated, and then he makes the decision. So I would simply say that the President's policy on Syria will be the President's policy as it is today. And Jay, there's a, a new poll out from uh, NBC uh, that says 58 percent of Americans still think that the country is in recession. Why do you think so many Americans uh, are not feeling some of the, the progress that the White House just described in terms of the housing market and jobs and other things? Because we still have so much work to do. Uh, one of the things you hear from the President all the time, one of the things you will hear from the President uh, as he makes another stop on his middle class jobs and opportunity tour uh, is that we need to keep at the business of helping this recovery along. Uh, we have come a long way from the worst recession since the Great Depression. Uh, we have uh, seen sustained economic growth and sustained job creation, but we are not where we need to be yet. Too many Americans are out of work still. 
too many middle class Americans are struggling to get by, uh, even those who have worked are still worried about how they're going to pay for their children's education, how they're going to care for their elderly parents. Uh, that's why we need to make the kinds of investments that uh, the President uh, wants to make and made clear both in his budget and in his State of the Union address because this economy needs to continue to grow. And we need to make the right choices when it comes to economic policy uh, to ensure that we are uh, strengthening and expanding the middle class. Uh, and uh, I think that the President has made clear since the day he took office in 2009 that this has been his number one priority. And he made clear at the beginning of this year in his State of the Union address and in the presentation of his budget uh, and in a series of events since then that the economy and the need to, uh, to have it to continue to grow, uh, the need to make investments that create jobs and spur economic growth remains his top priority. Yes? Um, I want to ask about the timing of this transition. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, it comes right before Tom Donnellan is departing right before these, these meetings, these foreign meetings with China and the G8 um, Africa. Um, I'm curious to know whether Tom Donilon, in his meetings with Chinese officials leading up to this visit, told them, look, I'm only going to be around till July. Well, let me correct the, uh, a little bit of, of, the, of an impression that might have been left from your question. The pre uh, Mr. Donilon, Tom Donilon is not leaving until the end of this month. He will be participating uh, in the meetings with the, uh, that the uh, President will be having with uh, the Chinese President, uh, precisely because Tom has been so key in uh, the formulation of the President's foreign policy and in the rebalancing effort uh, towards Asia that has been a cornerstone of the President's foreign policy. Uh, as I think has been reported, and I can say uh, that it's accurate, that the President uh, began discussing with Tom uh, Tom's desire to transition out of this job uh, after the election, and the President asked him to stay precisely because well, he had a, a series of transition moments with the appointment of a new Secretary of Defense and a new Secretary of State, but also, and his new CIA director, but also uh, some key foreign policy matters that he wanted Tom by his side uh, as he dealt with them. So, and that includes this upcoming meeting with the uh, Chinese President. But what um, challenges does this transition pose at this time, given that the key architect of the President's policy on China is leaving just ahead of his Well, I think this will be uh, a very smooth transition. Uh, as uh, you will hear from the President when he announces it today, this is a process that will take place over the course of roughly a month. And, you know, in Ambassador Rice, you're, we are having uh, someone take over as National Security Advisor who has been a principal on the President's foreign policy team from day one and even prior to his uh, election to the presidency. Uh, so that will be seamless. And we will have in Samantha Power uh, someone who has also been uh, a major player on the National Security Council for the President and an advisor to then Senator Obama dating back to 2005 on foreign policy issues. Uh, so I think this will be a very smooth transition and the President is enormously gratified that uh, Ambassador Rice and Samantha Power have uh, agreed to take these positions on because he has for so long depended on their advice and counsel. Jessica. Is the President girding for a contentious, contentious confirmation hearing for Samantha Power? I, we would not expect one. Uh, obviously the Senate will fulfill its responsibilities here, uh, hopefully with uh, speed uh, as well as deliberation. I think you've seen in the reaction to the news that uh, Sam Power will be nominated for this position, uh, a, a whole series of uh, experts in the field uh, who know her and have worked with her come out in support of that nomination and I think that reflects the standing she has uh, given her remarkable career both as a journalist who in 1993 saw images of emaciated men behind barbed wire in Europe and immediately headed to the Balkans to be a war correspondent. Uh, those of you who are familiar with her work on uh, genocide and her Pulitzer Prize winning uh, book, A Problem from Hell, uh, you know, know her passion for these issues. And she has been a uh, remarkable uh, and a remarkably effective advocate for the President's policies uh, as a member of the National Security Council team on UN and multilateral affairs. So I think that her, the breadth of her experience 
and uh, her effective advocacy for policy positions will serve her well in her confirmation process. Is the president going to press for a quick hearing, or would he even consider a recess appointment? I, the president expects the Senate to fulfill its responsibility uh, to consider this nomination and believes that Sam is fully qualified and will enjoy support from both sides of the aisle. And would you describe just a little bit the difference between Susan Rice and Tom Donlin's styles, how they might be different as national security advisor? You know, obviously everybody is, is different uh, in, a, in an administration in a White House. I think that it is, a, it, is, it is worth noting as people focus on what's new here, which is uh, a new national security advisor and a new ambassador to the United Nations, to take a moment to focus on uh, Tom Donilon's departure because he has been uh, an extremely effective, has been an extremely effective national security advisor. I think uh, for those of us who have been around a little bit of time and seen the importance of this role and know its importance his, uh, through history, especially modern presidential history, uh, we can say, I think, with great confidence that Tom has been uh, one of the most effective national security advisors that this country and, and any president has ever worked with. So, uh, and that uh, he is, you know, was by the president's side and a major player in the operation that took out Osama bin Laden, uh, was a major player in the uh, keeping of the promise to end the war in Iraq, uh, a major advisor and player in the uh, multi-agency process that is, uh, part, uh, that is uh, in effect now as we keep the president's commitment to wind down the war in Afghanistan. Uh, he is, as has been discussed already, at the forefront of the President's effort to uh, rebalance our foreign policy so that we are paying uh, the due attention to Asia that Asia requires uh, in the 21st century. So, uh, you know, it is, uh, I think, a testament to uh, Tom's skill uh, that he has played this major role in the way that he has, uh, and I know that the President is extremely grateful for that. John. Just got a clarification on uh, immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, over the weekend, the Republican chairman of the House Judiciary Committee said that he opposes a special pathway to citizenship uh, for the 11 million or so undocumented uh, immigrants in the United States. D for the White House, for the President, is a pathway to citizenship something that must be in a comprehensive yes. immigration bill? Yes, we've made that clear, and, and I think that's clear from the uh, statements of the President from the principles that have been uh, available to the public for so long, and, and clear from the uh, work of the Gang of Eight in the Senate uh, that has uh, moved along uh, uh, and making significant progress as it has emerged from committee in bill form, and, and I will be taken up on the Senate floor next week. The, you know, I think it's important to note that the elements that the President laid out as uh, essential to any comprehensive immigration reform have been reflected in uh, the work produced by a bipartisan group of senators and voted out of committee by uh, a significant bipartisan margin. We look forward to working with the Senate as they consider this legislation on the floor. And uh, as I noted the other day, this work is far from done. Uh, we uh, hope and expect that the Senate will vote in favor of a bill that reflects the President's principles and that the vote for that bill will be strong and bipartisan. And we have been working with the House Gang of Aid, so-called Gang of Aid as well, and with House members who have taken up this uh, need for comprehensive immigration reform and will continue that effort. There are, of course, going to be uh, challenges along the way. Uh, if there weren't, uh, we wouldn't be talking about this because it would have been achieved already. Uh, but uh, the President is very pleased with the progress we've seen so far, and you can be sure that his team is working very closely with Congress uh, to help bring about this very necessary uh, reform and legislation. All right, that seems clear. So just, just let me just clarify mm -hmm. a fine point here. If the, 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 this, if a bill was to be produced uh, along the lines of what the Republican Judiciary Chairman is talking about, a more of a piecemeal approach that falls short of a pathway to citizenship, this would be something the President would veto? The President, well, you're, you're speculating about a bill that doesn't exist, 
that might somehow emerge from one committee in the House and become the product of Congress. We certainly don't expect that. We, we expect the Senate to pass uh, uh, comprehensive immigration reform that reflects the uh, principles that the President has laid out and supports, and, and that reflects the principles that so many senators of both parties uh, support. Uh, and uh, we will work with the House, as the Senate will work with the House, as they move this process forward. So, but the President's been clear about what needs to be included as part of a comprehensive immigration reform package. And he's been clear about why immigration reform needs to be done in a comprehensive way. Uh, so I'm not going to speculate about outcomes that we don't expect uh, or even outcomes that, you know, may come to pass. Uh, right now, there's been substantial progress and we need to focus on the work that needs to be done. Ed Henry. Jay, um, <clears throat> Eric Holder, uh, Republicans uh, like uh, uh, Goodlatte, Sensen, Brenner are saying they want more information from him. They've set a 5 o'clock deadline. Obviously, the Justice Department view is they've turned over letters and information about the various media investigations. They so far feel like they've turned over enough information. Republicans are sort of at a standstill saying they want more information. Uh, point is, they're now threatening a subpoena to get the Attorney General to testify uh, if they don't get more information by 5 o'clock today. Would the White House expect the Attorney General to comply with that subpoena, or do you think that this is going overboard? And does the President uh, still I'm not even, uh, Ed, I'll ahead. be honest with you, I'm not even sure of uh, what efforts you're talking about here. The, the, they want more information about the scope of the investigations of various people in the media. and. Um, they, I believe it was Monday, the well, Justice just, Department turned over you. some info. They say they want more. <clears throat> I'd refer you to the Justice Department. I'm just not familiar with the particulars of House Republicans' Does requests. Does the General still have the full confidence of the President Absolutely. today? Absolutely. He's doing an excellent job, as I made clear when I was asked about this yesterday, and pointed to a statement by uh, Dennis McDonough. The Attorney General is, uh, has the full confidence of the President of the United States uh, and is uh, handling his job very well. Two other quick things. Uh, an Inspector General report has found that uh, former Defense Secretary Panetta uh, apparently leaked some top secret information to the filmmaker of uh, Zero Dark Thirty um, about the bin Laden investigation. There's some suggestion it might have been an in inadvertent leak at an award ceremony, but nonetheless, top secret information was leaked. Is, do you expect the Attorney General to have an investigation I, I, of this? I have not seen that report. I'll have to take the question. Okay. Uh, last thing, Susan Rice, you described her as one of the most qualified, experienced foreign policy experts in America. Uh, if that's the case, how did she get the information on Benghazi so wrong five days after the attack? And I welcome the opportunity to correct the record, especially for some news outlets who persist in uh, misrepresenting the facts. Uh, you have seen the so-called talking points. You have seen the testimony of the Deputy Director of the CIA. You have seen the documents themselves that demonstrate that the central contested point that Ambassador Rice made on those Sunday shows was drafted in the first instance and in every instance thereafter by the CIA. Central point being whether it was terror or that not? There, no, whether there was a protest, that, whether the uh, whether there were protests outside of the Benghazi facility that were inspired by, Cairo, uh, by the events in Cairo. The fact is the talking points said that there were extremists involved. And, and that was the, the, the decision to characterize them as extremists again. I would point you to statements by intelligence community senior officials who uh, have made clear that that was their judgment. And the idea that whether it was the president referring it, to it as an act of terror the next day after the events in Benghazi, or Susan Rice herself on one of the Sunday shows talking about uh, that it could be al-Qaeda, it could be al-Qaeda-related groups. The, 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 this is a false distinction that has been uh, propounded by Republicans uh, for political reasons uh, from the very first days after the events in Benghazi. And it has been an unfortunate fo focus uh, when the real focus should have been uh, and continues to be, as far as the President is concerned, on uh, taking the necessary measures to ensure that uh, our diplomatic security is uh, as strong as it can be so that this can't happen again, and to ensuring that we are doing everything we can to bring to justice those who uh, killed four Americans. And why did various intelligence officials say, various testimony elsewhere, that they almost immediately knew that this was terror? And if she's so experienced in these matters, why wouldn't she see that as they saw it, regardless of what the talking points say? So, 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 so you're suggesting that a senior member of the national security team should, should 
actually disagree with the assessments of the intelligence community provided by the CIA the because somebody who appeared on Fox News reports. perhaps uh, said no, something. No, because actually the intelligence, at know, one point General Petraeus yeah, I, said I, I the talking since. points he didn't want to agree with anymore because the talking points had been changed so much, the CIA director didn't think they were worth anything. And I, I honestly Is think, uh, one of the things that was written about was that the CIA director, General Petraeus, was, uh, disagreed with the removal of a point about a warning to the, uh, to the embassy in Cairo which reinforced, had it been included, the central point that the protests outside of Benghazi or the demonstrations and attacks outside of Benghazi had been inspired by what was happening in Cairo. So that, unfortunately, doesn't fit the narrative you're trying to propose here. Uh, I, I think there has been ample demonstration by the facts of the evolution of the talking points, the role that Ambassador Rice played in conveying the information that Director Clapper that Mike Morrell, that senior members of the intelligence community have made very clear were the assessments of the intelligence community. And in every iteration of this, Ambassador Rice made clear, as I did, that these were early assessments that were certain to change as we obtained more facts. Uh, and to suggest otherwise is just irresponsible. Yes. Thanks, Jay. I want to go back to the NBC News Wall Street Journal poll. Overall, it shows that the president's approval rating has held steady, but if you look at some of the internals, it tells a different story. Now only 28 uh, percent of independents say that he's doing a good job. That's down from 41 percent. Does that suggest that some of these controversies are, in fact, taking a toll on the president? Well, I think that uh, most Americans believe that their elected officials in Washington, from the president on down, should be focused on the matters that concern them the most the need to continue to grow the economy, uh, the need to take action on policies that help the middle class feel more secure and help the middle class expand, uh, the need to invest in our economy so that uh, the jobs of the future are created here in the United States, uh, the need to well, invest in innovation. Well, I mean, you can piece, a, you know, you can tease apart a poll that, as you said in the first instance, uh, was supposedly good news for the president and try to find bad news. We're not really paying attention to individual polls. We're paying attention to the work that needs to be done on behalf of the American people. Uh, and there is no question, I think, going to Josh's uh, point, uh, that the American people are still not satisfied with the economy. They, they believe that the, uh, their elected representatives and representatives in Washington need to take further action uh, so that the economy grows and that the economy grows in a way that benefits the middle class. And that is what the president's focused on. Is there any concern, though, that this could make it harder for him to get things passed in his second term, like immigration deficit reduction? I, I think that it, it has always been the case that when it comes to challenging legislative objectives the, and the requirement that there is bipartisan support for them, uh, that the uh, will to move forward with those uh, on the Republican side will depend on assessments by Republicans of what's in their interests as well as what's best, the best policy. And we believe that uh, whether it's immigration reform or the need to reduce the deficit in a balanced way, the need to invest in our economy so that we're rebuilding our infrastructure or uh, ensuring that our competitive advantage in fields of innovation continues, uh, that those decisions will be made by Republicans because they'll see it uh, the decision to cooperate with Democrats and with the President will be made because they'll see it as in their interests uh, to do so and in the interests of the American economy and the American people. I just want to shift to Syria quickly. It seems as though Bashar al-Assad and the government uh, seem to have taken the upper hand uh, in a number of key areas. Does that essentially dampen hopes that they will join in talks later this month, peace talks? And, and does it add pressure to this administration to do something <clears throat> and to take action in Syria? We are working with uh, our allies uh, to have those talks take place uh, in, uh, as part of the Geneva communique. Uh, we remain very concerned and we condemn in the strongest possible terms the Assad regime's assault on Qusair. Uh, the Syrian government and other parties to this conflict must fulfill their obligations under, in, under, under international human rights and humanitarian law uh, by immediately allowing neutral, impartial humanitarian organizations, including UN agencies, safe access to evacuate the wounded and provide life-saving medical treatment and supplies. 
You know, it is clear that the regime is unable to contest the opposition's control of a place like Qusair on their own, and that is why they are dependent upon Hezbollah and Iran to do their work for them. And as I've said before, the fact that a regime like Assad has as its uh, partners in tyranny here, Hezbollah and Iran, uh, says a great deal about uh, their intentions and the fact that Assad's principal concern has been uh, his own grasp on power, not uh, his own people, uh, people that he's butchered. So we are working with all of our allies and partners and the Syrian opposition uh, to strengthen the opposition, to uh, you know, isolate the Assad regime, and, and to bring about a peaceful transition. And we believe that uh, the conference that you mentioned in your question is part of that process. Do you have any expectation that the Assad government will participate on any level at this point in time? Well, we, we uh, certainly hope that that will be the case, and we are working with the Russians uh, as uh, who are fully supportive of this effort, uh, as well as others, to, to bring that about. Jay. Donna. Thanks, Jay. I just want to go back real quick to the Panetta report. Um, I, I think I just said I don't have, that's the, I, so I, I can't. No, no, I, I, it's I, just I, unclear. Yeah. If you had meant you hadn't seen the uh, journalism report, or you hadn't weren't aware of the DOD IG report. Uh, both, in, in, in both cases. Okay. I will have to take the question. Thank you. Can yep. you let us know? April. Jay, um, after Susan Rice um, did not gain the nomination for Secretary of State, it was pretty much an open secret around Washington that uh, she would be named National Security Advisor because that was a seat that she would have to be confirmed for. Did Republicans quibble about that at that time when that open secret was being bantered about around Washington? I, first of all, I'm not sure I agree that it was an open secret. I think that the President makes personnel decisions when he makes them, and then he announces them. So uh, there's that. On the second point, I think there's been a lot of discussion about uh, Ambassador Rice within the context uh, that Ed brought up, uh, but I haven't seen a great deal of discussion about uh, whether or not she would uh, take over as National Security Advisor until today. The President said early on this year that Susan Rice could fill any number of senior foreign policy posts in our government and perform uh, capably, as she has as United Nations Ambassador. And I think that that sentiment is reflected in his decision today to ask her to be his next National Security Advisor. Well, let me ask you this then. Did, were there any Republicans that talked to the White House around this time about her political future? If she doesn't make this, don't do that, or there will be consequences. Did you get any of that kind of? Not that I'm aware of, April. Yeah. Uh, Anne. Thank you. The jobs of UN ambassador and national security advisor are very, very different. Does the president consider this a promotion for Susan Rice? Well, I think they're very senior jobs, and uh, they're, they both positions are, uh, you know, principal positions uh, on the president's uh, nat uh, national security team. And uh, you're right that they're different jobs, and it says a great deal about Susan Rice that she is, uh, and the depth of her experience and qualifications, that she is eminently qualified and capable of fulfilling each role. Uh, she, as I mentioned earlier, uh, served on the National Security Council staff. She uh, has served at the State Department. Uh, and of course, now she's served at the United Nations. So uh, she is uh, you know, well versed in uh, the various agencies that are responsible for carrying out a president's foreign policy agenda and national security agenda and will be, um, will bring that experience to bear when she uh, takes her position uh, in the West Wing as national security advisor, which, you know, f a position for which uh, a keen understanding of the interagency process is, is vital, and she has that. Jay. Alexis. Jay, um, if we look at the president's foreign policy advisors, they've all, almost all of them are transitioning in the second term. Can you just summarize whether the president looks to these new uh, familiar faces, but new personalities and new positions as a, as a help to him in shifting into a second term foreign policy and executing that in a second term, or is it very much the same? He's not expecting uh, a new approach. I, 
I, as I said earlier, I think every individual in any position uh, who's capable and experienced and, and uh, br you know, brings something new to the table, uh, and even individuals like Ambassador Rice, who has served in one position and will now serve in another, uh, you know, bring something new by doing that. But uh, the President's foreign policy and his national security agenda are what they are, and, and his team helps uh, him develop his policies, uh, and then they implement those policies. And I think that, you know, Senator, you know, Secretary Kerry, when he was Senator and, and, and Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, was obviously uh, a key outside advisor, at, if you will, to the foreign policy team here, uh, and we worked very closely with him. Uh, Secretary Hagel uh, was uh, an advisor, an outside advisor to the President on foreign policy matters, as you know. So, and then, and then Susan Rice and Samantha Power have been in, internal advisors. So there's a continuity here, even as these positions have uh, changed and, and, and uh, the personalities have, have changed. But uh, look, I think there's always an opportunity uh, for um, the kind of, you know, when, when, when individuals take new roles to, to uh, you know, sort of further enhance the discussion about foreign policy objectives. And, and you know, the President has always insisted on you know, a, a kind of keen uh, discussion of these challenging issues among his principals, and he will expect that uh, now that his new team is being rounded out. Can you update us on what, how far along the, the um, investigation of chemical weapons reporting <coughs> in Syria may be, how long it may take? As I said the other day, we are working very uh, closely with our partners on this matter, with the United Nations with France and Great Britain, with the Syrian opposition, with others on this issue as we gather more evidence and, and sift through it. I, I, as was noted when this became an issue and we sent the letter to members of the Senate, we have evidence that gives us varying degrees of confidence to assert that chemical weapons were used in Syria. What we are still seeking is you know, the kind of uh, evidence to build on top of that existing evidence that makes a concrete case uh, for the assertion that chemical weapons were, have been used, that can demonstrate when and by whom they were used, and the consequences of that use. And we are about the business of uh, gathering that information. Can I just a sure. Um, Given the Syrian advances and the help they're getting from Iran and Hezbollah and Russia, does that change the President's thinking about what he might be able to do to help the rebels? In other words, does that change, change the ability of the U.S. to, to change the outcome on the ground? The situation in Syria remains extremely difficult, there is no question. And uh, as the President retains every option, in response to that situation and evaluates the options available to him, he is mindful of ongoing developments there. You know, we have been clear from the President on down that we rule out no option, and he continues to assess uh, the possibilities here in terms of action that we might take or we might take uh, together with partners or allies uh, to help bring about the policy objective that we seek, which is the transition peaceful transition uh, away from the ba uh, Bashar al-Assad regime in Syria. It, it, we are continuously mindful of the fact that we don't want to make policy decisions that inadvertently make that objective harder to achieve, and, and that is something that we take into account as, we, uh, as well as the President and his team uh, make assessments about the options available. Uh, but there is no question that the challenges that we see in Syria this, the, the suffering and the violence and the, uh, you know, the, 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 the tyranny exer uh, exhibited by the Assad regime uh, make clear how uh, serious the situation is and uh, make clear why we need to uh, do what we have done, which has become the uh, top uh, provider of humanitarian assistance, the top provider of non-lethal uh, direct assistance to the Syrian opposition and to the the opposition military. So uh, 
but we are continuing to assess uh, the options available to us. Mindful of the developments to mean that there's a, that you've made a conclusion that the dynamic has changed. I mentioned earlier, I think, in response to a similar question, that we're not going to provide, uh, you know, battlefield assessments of, of, uh, you know, which way the fight is going based on, you know, events in one town or, uh, you know, what is clear is that Assad does not have control of his country. Uh, what is clear is that there is a great deal of carnage taking place in Syria, and that Assad is ultimately responsible for it, and. Uh, that is why we are acting with our partners and allies and the opposition to bring about a transition. Jim. Connie. Thank you. There are some reports uh, that the new UN ambassador has a strong uh, history against Israel. Do you expect, if that's true, does the administration expect that to be a factor in confirmation? Uh, well, it's not true. Uh, so there's that. The um, fact of the matter is, as a lead staffer at the national, uh, the lead st staffer at the National Security Council on United Nations and multilateral issues, Samantha uh, Power consistently led the effort to stand up against all efforts to delegitimize I Israel, and she supported Israel's right to defend itself, and that includes uh, opposing the one-sided Goldstone report, blocking efforts to single out Israel in the Security Council after the flotilla incident and opposing unilateral Palestinian efforts to achieve statehood at the United Nations. Samantha Power is a proven friend and supporter of Israel and the U.S.-Israel relationship, and she will continue to carry uh, that forward as our next U.N. ambassador. Jay. Yes, ma'am. Um, Jay, a group is planning a protest in front of the White House on June 17th, calling for the president to execute a border that would stop the so-called war on drugs, especially against people of color. And on the heels of the Supreme Court decision to um, allow law enforcement to take DNA for those arrested. I'm just wondering what the President's position <coughs> is on this and if the administration has any further action planned on uh, the so-called war on Well, the President's, that we, we have a document that we produce every year that I would point you to in terms of the President's policy positions when it comes to uh, illegal drug use and uh, his approach uh, to, uh, which includes a robust effort uh, towards uh, prevention and treatment uh, and is not focused solely on uh, the criminalization aspects of this uh, or the law enforcement aspects of it. I don't know about the protest, uh, but uh, I would point you to the, to the President's policy positions uh, on these matters. Yeah. Don, I mean, sorry, Kathleen. Um, can you, uh, the, uh, the First Lady at an event last night was um, confronted by a protester who was asking about the um, executive order for federal contractors. And I'm just wondering if you could explain again why the President hasn't signed the executive Well, I did yesterday, order. so uh, I could point you to what I said yesterday. Uh, the President fully supports a legislative effort, uh, uh, a bill called ENDA, uh, on this matter. And, uh, you know, again, I would just point you to what I said yesterday. The legislative effort doesn't seem to be going anywhere, and given what you know about how Congress is moving things, I think it's unlikely to move. So I'm just wondering. I think that that assessment is, is made frequently uh, uh, about uh, difficult propositions, but that does not mean we should not support it, and it does not mean that it won't come to pass. But there's some reason you think it should be a legislative effort and not an executive effort. You know, I, again, I've addressed this many times, but the uh, we do believe that that's the right way to go. It was the right way to go and with Don't Ask, Don't Tell and the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and this is the, the, we believe this is the right way to go uh, strategically, and that's why we're working with Chairman Harkin and others uh, and pushing for this uh, legislatively. Mark. Follow up on that. Any chance uh, you ask the President what he thinks of the way Mrs. Obama responded to a heckler last evening? Uh, I haven't asked the President that, but uh, it's my personal opinion that she handled it brilliantly. Uh, on, uh, on Tom Donilon, what is the reason he is stepping down? Is he burned out? Is it that kind of a job? <laughs> well, I think these are challenging jobs, but he is not. Uh, in fact, uh, anybody who's uh, seen Tom and knows Tom knows that he is uh, one of the most uh, enthusiastic and energized people in the West Wing. Uh, you know, in, in one of the most challenging positions imaginable, uh, Tom Donilon, uh, you know, approaches his work with, uh, you know, sheer love of service and zest for the challenges, uh, you know, that 
we could all emulate, quite honestly. I remember running into him once on West Executive at, not long after he'd become National Security Advisor, and you know there were just all sorts of significant challenges happening in the world of national security and foreign affairs, and and uh, you know he was you could just tell how much he uh, enjoyed uh, playing this role, serving the president, serving his country, and I think it is as true today as it was. Uh, on that occasion. So uh, I think the fact is that from the day he walked in here, he has been uh, you know, leading the National Security Council. He's been National Security Advisor for almost three years. Uh, and and uh, he approached the President after the election about making a transition. The President asked him to stay uh, longer, and, and Tom has done that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, he uh, He's done a remarkable job. I know the president agrees. And um, will Ambassador Rice start uh, trying to get up to speed right away? Will she go uh, to the China summit or G8 or? Uh, or I don't. I don't trip? believe that she's. Uh, uh, Tom is coming to the to the uh, to California for the uh, for the China meetings, the meetings with the president of China. And the G8 in Africa. He's uh, still doing those. Uh, I, I, I believe. I believe he's doing the G8. I'm, I'm not sure about Africa. The the but I can I can get that for you. Is she on staff? I, no, I don't believe so. I don't believe Ambassador Rice is traveling with us uh, between now and when she takes over as NSA. Okay. Yes, sir. Just a follow up on yesterday's Bitcoin briefing on the visit of Chinese President. Uh, the senior officials say territorial disputes will come up as a topic during the uh, meeting. So, what's the expectation of the uh, that President Obama has over the discussion? on the maritime tension, and also will Taiwan issue ever come up during the meeting? As I've said repeatedly, it is a hallmark of our relationship with China and the way that we approach our relationship with China that we speak very clearly and candidly about all the issues uh, that uh, the two countries deal with, and that includes all the areas of cooperation and the areas where we seek uh, deepening cooperation, the, the areas of uh, the ways that our economies are intertwined as the two largest economies in the world, the ways that we can uh, cooperate uh, more fully in, in the national security sphere and the military sphere. Uh, and it also includes the, 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 those areas where we disagree or we, we have different points of view and we discuss them all. Uh, so I don't have a specific uh, preview of the issues that will be raised and how they will be discussed, but, but we have always been very uh, direct in our meetings with the President and his meetings with his counterparts and uh, our Secretary Clinton and Secretary Kerry and, and, and Tom Donnell and others with their counterparts uh, on the whole array of uh, issues that uh, we always discuss with the Chinese. So I think that, you, you know, you can be sure that that will be the President's approach and he looks very, uh, very much looks forward to his discussion with President Xi. Okay. What's the stand on, on Taiwan? What's that? What's the... Why Our opposition on Taiwan is unchanged. I think i got to go so that you guys can go out yeah. to the Rose Garden. Thanks very much.